Is there a motion, please? Your Honor, I move we direct staff to pursue negotiations consistent with the discussion that we had in closed session. Second. It's been moved and second. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Kathleen? McCampbell? Aye. Scott? Aye. Wilson? Aye. Davidson? Aye. Fleming? Aye. So now, do we, we need a motion to adjourn. Okay. Uh, I, I move that we adjourn this special meeting. Second. Move and second. Kathleen? McCampbell? Aye. Scott? Aye. Wilson? Aye. Davidson? Aye. Fleming? Aye. Thank, thank you. You guys have got to be the best council on the planet. Right? Thank you. You guys are out. Thank you. Okay. to have some mayor's awards. Do you want to take these down, Kathleen? I'll just bring them down. I'll just bring them down. I'll go ahead and take them. Uh, we have some mayor's awards, um, and we have uh, public hearing number two. It's consideration of a sale of property locally known as 1336 Garnet Street, City of Burlington, Iowa, with conditions continued from June 19, 2017, City Council meeting. Mr. Tisla. This again, a vacant property. We did have interest from neighbors to the north and south. Uh, did check. We are able to sell it to both uh, neighbors. Um, check with the courthouse as far as going through the process, too. To, uh, sounded like everything was fine there. I was just confirming, but talked to our attorney, and we can sell it to both neighbors there. So uh, at this point, uh, neighbor to the north had desired 15 feet, and the neighbor to the south desired the remaining. Um, so that's how we're moving forward, uh, unless someone else comes forward to, uh, offer something else, I guess, but uh, we can sell it to, to both neighbors. Did you find out if we could take that action without offering it as for, for sale, public hearing, or does it? We'd, if we get the um, current mark, fair market value, we can. Uh, if we're selling for less, then we'd have to go through a bidding process, it sounds like. All right. So if someone shows up like last time for and makes Tim, a $600 bid, then... I'm trying to remember all of Patrick's email. Tim had asked about whether we'd be able to sell the property to the neighbors without going through the bid process if someone else showed up, similar to the email Patrick responded to today. Uh, the, the one with the lot split? Yeah, as far as setting a policy on selling to neighbors versus... Um, like, like listening, to, listening to what... Patrick had to say on that, or reading what he had to say on that, uh, the concern, um, if the more restrictions that you put like that on, on that lot, uh, on a, you're, uh, you're needing to now change your price structure and how you think about your pricing on it. Yeah. Um, and think more about a, a value than Fair needing market. to be at, a, yeah. at, at, at the least at what is it uh, assessed at. Yeah, I understand that. That makes sense because you've limited you've limited the prop the the number of people who can do that to such an extent that but not not that, that won't can't. always be the case what's that that won't always be the case you know if we have some sort of property we mail out to the adjoining lots and they're like no I don't want that one it? then it goes on <coughs> I don't know I just I, I don't know how many people would, I guess, go for it then if it was market rate. A lot fewer. Yeah. yeah. And then, so then what do we do? Do we start the auction at market rate? How does that work? You'd probably, if you're going to have a policy like that, you wouldn't, you wouldn't bring it forward, I wouldn't think, unless you are... I mean, typically now, if you have someone who offers on a piece of property, you bring it forward to yeah. go through the process and see if anyone else brings forward an, a higher offer. You would probably, on in that scenario, now not bring then it forward it until it. you have a someone who's offering that kind of mm -hmm. figure. So then we um, end up which would be just, a hard uh, sell. Then we end up hanging on to these properties and having yeah. to take care of them. Given the scenario that you're trying to avoid, this might not be the... 
reading through what I saw from what he's saying, it's not probably the best avenue to try to accomplish that. It's clearly going to cause way you're going to cause other than you're going to have other limitations based off of it. So unfortunately, yeah, well, we're just going to have to let it go and see what happens. See what happens. Yeah. You guys good? Yeah, we need to have a common sense discussion on it. Yeah, you're right. But jacking the price up to market rate is not a very yeah, viable not solution. Not going to get it back. Are we ready to move? The only thing I could, I and mean, we have the conditions that you have to pay by the following day, and you have to complete a home within 180 days. Maybe it's mm -hmm. you have to apply for and be approved for a building permit within 30 or 60 days so that it doesn't shorten the time lead on for six months. Maybe it's just a two month period. Then, if they don't apply for a building permit in two months, then then it could come back, which would be for anyone. So that might yep. be a way to that's groovy. Make it so it's not so prolonged if someone else does buy it and doesn't do anything right. with it. Which might be helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we could look at that for as a conditions. That would be that would be nice to. Have. You guys groovy? Yep. Yes. Okay. Number three, consideration of plans and specs for the 2017 Law Enforcement Center. Oh, all right. That's yeah. <laughs> been a long. Yeah. 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 I was hoping you would share in my excitement. Because <laughs> really had a great time. Time. last Monday and Tuesday down at the Architect, so we got into some of the details. But if you don't mind, I'm going to go here by Eric, so we can use the overhead projector and just kind of. I'm not going to go into every little detail. And Perry Hines from. Carly Nelson, who's been extremely helpful for me on this project, will be here at the council meeting to cool. go into any details that you might or questions you might need answered from that perspective. But Great. I'm just going to kind of go through some basic plans and where we're at on that, okay? Outstanding. Through some things, my friends. Oh, oh, Great center. center. All right. Okay. Well, to start with, real quick, this is the existing drive up. This would be the drive up here, and the lanes are over here, the teller lanes. So everything you see in this diagram that's X'd out here or crossed out will all be part of the demolition. And these will be infilled with asphalt. So as you go through this, you can, if you've been down there, you know where all these islands are. So those are going to go. And we're going to get that kind of as flat as we can. And we're going to propose that we have an entrance here. And then the exit will be over here. Now keep in mind, as we try to keep this project within budget, for now this parking lot's going to get done. And we'll see where we end up with our budget, whether we can build walls and a roof over this structure or not. So, I mean, we're just going to have to see where we come in because so it's, it's a definite obligation to be in budget. Main Street's at the bottom down here? Yeah, I'm okay. sorry. Main Street's here and then Valley Street's over here. And as Chief talks about this, the original project looked to have this be a covered and enclosed. Right. And as we got cost estimates come back, uh, started working on what that's going to what the costs are going to be to do the, the whole project, the different pieces. We had some expansion of areas that were renovated inside as one thing that changed some of the cost components um, and not having anyone to split those costs with. Right. Um, but, and then I don't know what else came into it. I know there were a couple other things that came in that changed some of the cost components too. Uh, but in order to stay in that dollar amount, the, the, the one of the biggest ticket items that we ended up looking as having to take out is having that enclosed covered parking. We, but, can't, do, we can't even do covered? But yeah. what I think what, you're, what we're doing on this project is there are one or two different alternates that are being bid out to... Yeah, and we had decided not to put this in as an alternate because if okay. we put it in as an alternate, we have to have it designed and have the architect fee. So I think we're going to wait and see how the project turns out and see where we come in after the bids are submitted. And then what we could do then is have it designed and have it as an, as an alternate. That's an addendum on the back side. But with that said, where the, this is where the roof, the current roof comes out. So we, we're going to be able to fit about 10 spaces underneath this roof. 
So, and what that'll do for us is like we had discussed, I mean, most of our winds out of the north and northwest in the winter time, and this direction is north, so we could put 10 squad cars in there, and I think for the very most part is keep them free of, of winter debris, if you will, for lack of a better word, until we can figure out where we're gonna be as far as putting a roof on this. And part of the, the contingency with the roof, even without the walls, is it was still gonna have to be sprinkled. And so with that said, that's a big cost driver on this structure as well as getting this sprinkled. So as long as you have that in the back of your mind, that's a big cost driver. How many total uh, squad cars do we have? Well, we have 14 marked cars. Total, we need about 20 spaces total or 21 to just take care of the cars that are there every day. But on duty at any one time, we usually have, well, with the SROs in the summer, you'd have a, about eight and then shift, you, you, you need a minimum of six or seven every day to run a shift. So, like I said, this would be adequate to keep those cars, you know, fairly clean in the winter time. It's already got a roof. If you can kind of picture that down there, that roof really cantilevers out over that parking lot quite right. a way. Right. And this structure over here, between this structure and these, there's an existing roof here. And so, with that said, I mean, as we, talk about planning this to be an enclosed structure, it, those two roofs are really gonna help us in the money we're gonna have to spend. So one thing we are researching right now that might be part of this bid package is what would a, a louvered type fence, a fencing structure cost us? If we just build in two doors and had a fencing structure so we could still maintain that safety, yeah. security, and privacy as we wait for the complete structure. And if we can't do it now, I mean, the bottom line, we just build it in in the future as a capital project and see where the money falls out and see how it becomes a, a priority to get that done. But the, all the designs are moving forward knowing that we, we want to have that, that parking. Absolutely. That's our full intention. And that both the architect and Carl A are well aware of that. I mean, and we've gone round and around with a way to keep the project within budget and maintain the parking space because that was one of the most important things to me. But right now, it's got to stay within budget. We, we have to be within budget, and then let's see where we're at after that. And the way the plan is put together and what you're going to see is the project's within budget. So that's wow. the right approach. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Well, then we're, we're going to start with the basement. And I'll kind of walk you through this. I'll kind of zoom this a little bit, Eric. And I kind of zoom past it, but everything else that you saw is just going to be unfinished open space. Like down in here will be open space. Over here will be unfinished open space. We can use for storage or whatever we decide to use it for. And I don't know if you can quite read that yet, but basically this will be the the men's locker room and in this check set we didn't have the lockers drawn into this but now we have that detail that includes the lockers and so now we're here you're going to have the the women's locker room restroom shower facilities or here's a utility room where we'll store garbage janitorial things that kind of stuff and then all this leads out into a fitness room this will be the fitness room. We already currently have all the equipment. We'll just move the equipment that got donated to the police department from our building to this building to put in there for fitness. So that'll be the main structure of the basement. This is currently a vault. Those vaults from first floor, from the basement, first floor, second floor, all line up and they're all poured solid concrete. So as part of this, it's going to be unused space, but eventually we'd like to add some tactical lockers to this space with some benches because the room's big enough that tack gear takes up a lot of space and it's a place that they could do their debriefing and actually do some walkthroughs. Is there, is there planning to enter a building after they make up their plan, we do what we call walkthroughs. In other words, we try to mimic the space we're getting ready to enter as best we can and walk through that. So our first time is not our first time. And so we'll be able to use some of this space for that without, at this point, really costing us any money at all. The mechanical room, it currently houses the generator. And, and kind of where we're at on the generator now is to move the generator we have at the police department. It'll be outside where I was showing you in the far corner of that parking lot. 
okay. is to move that outside and replace the current generator that's in there. The generator that's in there is an Onan generator, and I believe it was 30 or 50 kW, and our Caterpillar generator is 150 kW, and it's a lot newer. Our generator is probably 25 years newer. Our generator is not going to run the whole building, but without DESCOM being in our building, it'll do more than, than what we need it for. And part of the plan, we thought, well, let's keep this generator and we'll bring ours over. But just the switch gear alone for to run both those generators was like $80,000 to automatically switch that. So that became not an option real quick. But I was not comfortable with the Onan generator that's in there. It runs the emergency lighting in the building and the sump pumps. And that's it. And it's an older generator. And... and uh, we're going to see what it's going to take to get our generator out of the basement and get it moved over there, which I don't think will be really all that big of a deal, really. So that's kind of the basement. So if you have any questions as we go along, feel free to ask. Some of these are a little bit. Does that generator have some value for somebody to purchase from us? The Onan generator that's in there, what we're hoping it has enough value that somebody will remove it for free. Okay. for the cost of the generator <laughs> in all seriousness but because yeah. it would cost us you know a few thousand dollars to have it removed no, so that's a good idea that was our discussion at some at one point we, there was discussion wasn't there about a firing range down there is that yeah and that's a space well, let me slide this over that would be the space over here along this this side right here all right and that's where it was planning on going but like I said, again, the cost of the firing range was about a half a million dollars. Gee. So for a six stall range, it just it was out of our price range. It's something we couldn't afford. But I mean, futuristically, as we talk about these capital improvements or projects, I mean, those are all, you know, it's important things. I mean, right now we qualify four times a year and we pay a minimum of to every officer two hours overtime to do that because it's that big hollow and we can't do it on duty. So, I mean, over the course of time, you talk about savings, but you know, as we discuss that, probably in today's world, just as importantly or more importantly, would be to have a discussion about these new 360 degree simulators. Now, I know a lot of you have went through the simulator we had in our basement that was strictly, you know, one dimensional. Well, they yeah. make those now in three dimensional, oh, and they wrap around, and it's really critical. Shoot, don't shoot. And I think that we could start a regional hub with that. I don't think you could ever make enough money to pay for it, but you could offset some of your costs because there would be departments from, you know, within several hundred miles, I think, that would drive to go through those de-escalation scenarios. Mm -hmm. I mean, in today's world, that's really important. So, you know, that would maybe be something to think about, too. Would I think our money would be better spent on a tool like that versus a live firing range. Mm -hmm. I really do. Just don't have me do it. I did it <laughs> down in San Antonio a couple of years ago. And that's I right, you hostage. did. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, James. Way to go. It, ha it happens. You probably weren't the first or the last. I wasn't going to tell on you. <laughs> so now we'll move up to the first floor just to kind of get you acclimated. This is the current entrance now, and this is Jefferson Street again over here, and then down here would be Main Street along this end. So that's the lobby that you'll walk into now, and, and then once you come through that, you'll actually enter kind of a secured area. From here, there'll be a door there and a door here, and that the reason we moved the door there is so we could open up these restrooms. These will actually be restrooms for the public or somebody that maybe comes in and they're waiting on an interview or waiting to do a report or whatever, they would actually have access to a restroom. This will be the records area, which briefly, if you notice, that's all those windows. There's 15 foot of windows along there. That's very concerning to me from a security perspective with the clerks that are working in here. So the plan we've come up is to build a wall that'll be seven foot tall, and there'll be about three feet in between the windows and the wall. And this wall will be ballistic panels. Along up here will be ballistic panels, and this will be bulletproof glass right here to protect our civilian employees. But what that'll do is create kind of a shadow box down here, and they're going to build a soffit over that with bright LED lighting, and that's where actually the, it's going to say, you know, City of Burlington, Burlington Police Department, will have a kind of an identifier of our building, if you will, inside that shadow box. I got a little bit of concern with that tinted glass, but they promised me these LED lights will be more than bright enough shining down, so we'll see how that works out. And the reason we went seven foot with the wall, one, ballistic panels are expensive, 
but two, we still now have eight foot of light, of natural light that can come in and help light this area. That's good. So with that said, every wall that you see here on the first floor is going to go clear to the ceiling. And you know how high those ceilings are down there if you've ever been in that building. But with this room, with the, the natural light coming in, the new ceiling will be at that deck height. But that will be the only ceiling at that deck height. Everything else in here will be a standard 9 foot 4 inch ceiling. But the problem we have in our current building is they didn't take the time to build these walls clear up to the deck. And it just, the noise in the building just echoes and bounces back and forth. So all these walls will go up to the deck, but the ceiling will be nine foot four inches. So there will be an interview room here and an interview room here. And, and that's, we don't have a space right now for somebody that might come to the front counter that's upset about whatever the case may be. And we don't really have any place privately we can take them without entering the secured facility. And so we'll have that where the, the person can come in here for some privacy and the officer will enter in this way and close those doors and it'll be a soundproof room and we can provide some, nice some peace and quiet to those people that, that need it. This will be another <laughs> interview room for that exact same purpose. And then once you enter here, here's the, that other vault that lined up, I was telling you, that come up to both mm -hmm. floors. And this is going to be an employee break room, there'll be a sink and just some things, a place for the employees. This vault door. I don't remember now, Jim, you might help me out, but it weighed like 18 or 20 tons. I was going to say it 9 was, ton. Yeah, it was, it was, it was heavy enough they weren't going to be able to remove it. So we're just going to frame around that door, and you really won't even know that door was ever there to enter this break room. But then there's a room here, some space to clean guns, which we really currently don't have a space for that. But when I was down there and we were talking about the details of the building, they explained to me that this will be a soffit material, and underneath that soffit material will be ventilation hoods. So that solvent and that cleaning supply, I mean, if you clean a gun now in our building, you'll smell it all afternoon. You can smell everything in that building. Yeah, and the weed's really bad. But So anyway, that'll take care of that. And back here will be our armory where we can store all of our shotguns, AR-15s, all of our ammunition, extra handguns. Another mechanical room, janitorial space, a toilet. But as we move through here, there will be, all these are existing offices. If you've ever been down there, and those existing offices are going to stay. I mean, we'll gut those and put new carpet in them, new ceiling tile and paint them. But there's no sense of, of tearing all this down and starting over because those are the exact spaces that we need. And these will be all of our patrol commanders that will occupy these offices. And down here will be, a, again, more toilets. Over here will be animal control and parking enforcement, central supply. And this is the entrance that goes off to Main Street. So then in the center here will be evidence storage. It will be in here. Over here will be our briefing room for patrol officers, patrol supply, juvenile holding. And what that is is just a soft room, a place that we can bring juveniles into. And keep in mind, when I talk about these rooms, none of these rooms are detention. We don't have any ability, and we don't want the ability to lock somebody in the room, if you will. So keep that in mind. Then the officer's room where they can do reports, report writing, and there's a separate room here if they would need to get isolated for some reason to dictate a report. Most of that will happen in here, but as we have some more of these more serious crimes, it takes a a lot of space to lay out all your information before you start to dictate. They'll have an option to go in here. This is what we're going to call bag and tag. In other words, the officer brings evidence in off the street. He goes in here, he processes it, he bags it, and these are passed through lockers. And so he'll lock it in a locker and the evidence tech, which is already inside this secure facility, will take it out of there and do whatever additional processing that may or may not be done and log it into the evidence system. So that's something that is just going to be really, really efficient that we've never had before. I mean, currently they bag and tag downstairs, they put it in a locker, an evidence tech has to scan it, put it in a cart, take it upstairs, scan it into the, I mean, it just goes on and on. Yeah. So, and, and again, this big part of this evidence storage will be all massive ventilation. So, and in here will be another real nice advantage that we've never had. What we'll be able to do in here is do evidence conferencing with defense attorneys, prosecuting attorneys, victims. We can come in here and we can actually view video evidence or look at physical evidence. 
or do all those things without this evidence really ever leaving this secure evidence facility, <laughs> which is really, really important for the chain of custody with evidence. You guys are going to be so much more efficient in this bill. Yeah, it's going to be really, it's going to be unbelievable. And I, looking through the plans, I was getting excited, but for the first time when I went to the architects in Kansas City, they actually had a 3D rendering of what the building was going to look like. And, and they're going to get me some snapshots of that that I can share. That is proprietary software, so I couldn't actually get you hooked into that. But that's when it really started to come to light to me, just how nice this is going to be. So that's just a real quick overview of what the first floor. And keep in mind, this is primarily all patrol operations on the first floor. And the second floor will be completely gutted and starting from scratch. But this is kind of some of the, this was going to be a break room and we we're going to use some of this for investigator space for, this is when we were planning on having either sharing it with the county attorney or sharing it with the sheriff's office. And so that was one of our first real cost drivers as we were trying to develop all of this unused space. And we just decided, well, we're not going to develop, we're not going to do anything with it. But futuristically, you know, I don't know if, if maybe like an adult probation or I mean, I think there's some other options out there that maybe we could somehow make this space available. So you, you'll never see that. Uh, you'll never see that option ever changing in the future. You know, I don't with the county, at least okay. not currently. But I do, like I said, I think there might be some options with maybe probation, <clears throat> parole, maybe some type of Department of Human Services, Mental Services, or I can think a lot of. There's a lot of people we partner with that maybe someday okay. could have an interest. And that's why we left this unfinished space in this part of the building, because we have access. There's an elevator here and stairs here that come up from, from downstairs. So it made the most sense to just leave this space unfinished. And these are current restrooms that exist. And any current restrooms in the building, we're just going to clean those up, but we're really not going to put a lot of money. There's no need to tear them out and put in brand new when we can clean them up and make them work. So. Amen. And we'll kind of slide over here. And again, this is uh, the vault then from the other two floors that's on. This currently has safe deposit boxes. But we're not gonna, we're not gonna box in this door like we did downstairs. I just think that somebody may be a little more creative than can me. We can come up, we'd really like to turn this space into our police museum. We don't have to renovate the space, maybe put carpet in it, but we got a lot of artifacts from over the years that we've saved and we got some display cases. And then this would just be the perfect space for that. And, and somehow we can surely incorporate that vault door into that process. I mean, it's pretty cool. like a time vault of the police department or kind of maybe, like I said, something more creative than me. And also keep in mind that this was a bank building that maybe 50 years from now, you know, would help keep that in mind too. So, but that's, it's an unused space. That's just an idea of what we're going to do with it that doesn't cost a lot for renovation. This will be the lobby area as you come up from downstairs. And again, this will be a secured area. You won't be able to get anywhere once you get up to here without us passing you through. So this is our multi-use room, and we talked a lot about this in the development of the police department. This is a room that not only we'll use for like regional training, but just as importantly, this is a space that we can do training for our in-service. I mean, currently we now try to use the council chambers or a place to get 30 or 40 officers, where now we're going to have space to maybe get 100 or 120 officers nice. in, a, in a room that we can, you know, actually give some instruction on some law enforcement matters and bring some, some schools to our community. <coughs> if we bring a school to town and get other agencies to participate, one, anybody that we send to the school is free. So, and plus it's here, we wouldn't have to pay for meals or hotels or those other things. So that's going to be a great, a great use. And this is just a storage room for the chairs and tables for this room. And we'll go through the outside. This will be the chief's office. Uh, that's where all of our administrative files. And I really wanted to keep the current like we have at our, our building now. I mean, Kristen, she sits here, and she sits right in between a major and myself, which is really nice for the transfer of information, and it saves a lot of steps. And so we're going to leave that the same. This says administrative captain. Well, that, that'll be the major, the other major's office. Then as we move down, you're starting the CID with the CID command officers. 
We wanted to try the bullpen approach for all of our investigators. All the new police facilities are doing this approach where all the investigators are in the same room and they're just kind of divided by cubicles just to keep those lines of communication open. So we're going to try that. I, I think that everybody else is using it and they're satisfied with it. And it's going to, one, save some money on renovation, but more importantly, I think, make a better use of the space. In this room here, it says a workroom. Well, really what will be in here is like upstairs copiers, printers, those kind of things. And then we'll just start moving into the interview rooms. So any, any interviews that the detectives are doing or if patrol got full up downstairs and needed to use a room, these rooms will be available to them. This is what we're going to call a soft interview room where, again, you maybe you have a child or you have a victim of a sexual assault. And this room will look more like a living room type setting or a very neutral setting that somebody that's really been traumatized can kind of hopefully try to relax a little bit as they're being interviewed because that's, that's a no fun process to go through. And there was going to be a, a window here, a reception type window. We don't have an investigative clerk. I think someday with the call load that we have, I think that's something that will be worthy of discussion, but it's not in the budget now and we don't have one. So again, we'll just turn this into another interview room. When we have these major cases right now, we only have three interview rooms and it's, it's no good. We've got people sitting out in the lobby that need interviewed and they really don't have any business talking to each other. So <laughs> this is going to be nice. Really, really nice. And then there will be some, some public restrooms here that somebody that maybe was being interviewed or whatever would have access to. Along with this, this interview or restroom here is going to be a secured restroom where the toilet flush button is on the outside just to make sure if we had somebody we were interviewing that thought they might have some evidence they were trying to destroy or whatever. This, well, they'll use this restroom. They won't be able to do that. Who's, whose idea was it to come up with that? Man? Well, actually, in all the, all the new modern facilities, they have this type of restroom because every now and then, you know, you get people that... Slickers. Yeah, have a little different idea. Exactly right. <laughs> so this will be at a, it says an administrative conference room, but at the same time, you know, if we have overflow, this is really going to be nice for, like, uh, command meetings and, and those kind of things. Or if we had a major incident and we wanted to get, like, the media all into one room for some reason, this would be the perfect place to do it. They're going to have a major case room that they've never had before that will be fully multimedia because they really use GIS and some of these technology functions now that we don't have access to, so that will be nice. So that's just kind of a, a basic overview of what the new police department's going to look like. And I know I probably took more time, but it's like something that really needed to be explained. I like that you get the corner office there. I think that's yeah, and it had nice windows. You yeah. still can't really see the river so much yeah. like you can now. But, yeah, that was the architect's idea, actually. I like it. Man, I'll tell you what. This is, uh, it's been a long process. It's not done yet, but, man. That's do we, great. Do That's we know great. when U.S. Bank is moving? Uh, they're still set on that date, that so, August 8th or 9th. Yeah. And I know that that date is really solid because they're talking about moving safety deposit boxes. So mm -hmm. okay, that, that date's going to be what it is. So is it going to take us a year from now, you think? You know, I don't think it will. It, de it depends on who you talk to. As I talk to the architects, they think eight to nine months. Carl A. thinks maybe eight to ten months. So I think you're in that you know, as an average nine months. So, you know, if we really get to, to go on with demo late August or the first part of September, I mean, I, I think that that June 1st time frame would be a reasonable goal. I mean, they, they think it could be sooner than that, but I don't like to put that out there. I want to have a little cushion in there. Yeah. I just know how projects go. Yeah. I'm looking forward to walk through a day, man. Yeah. That's awesome. It'll be a big day for the yeah. whole community. Invite me. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, what a dramatic. You'll be there. Thank you. Guys, you, thank you, you Chief. Yes. Yeah. Thank oh, you. yeah. Thanks for your support. Appreciate it. Awesome. Okay. Uh, number four, motion for preliminary thank adoption God. of the second Thanks reading of an ordinance vacating and selling a portion of Denmark Street right of way located west of South Main Street. Mr. Tesla. Wouldn't take much to knock it down. The second reading. Um, second reading. Got anything Did, meet with the property owners on this um they had a inquiry i guess uh typically we split it down the middle and they had both uh just stopped by my office on 
Friday, I believe it was, uh, they wanted the north property owner to have 18 feet and the southern property owner to have the remaining, so the north property owner that area in the black box, um, which I think we'd need, want to amend it to include that language in the ordinance if that's uh, okay with council. Uh, they both stopped in and felt that would be more usable to the neighbor on the north who originally requested the vacation. <clears throat> and then their question originally as well, uh, neighbor to the north had uh, uh, applied and uh, was going to seek all of the uh, right away and had given the price of $500. The neighbor to the south uh, indicated they'd like some of it. In the ordinance it says uh, $500 for each purchaser and they requested whether that could be split, $500 total split between the two. So I wanted to pass that along and get any input back to them. Wait, do we have to have that as an amendment? Yeah. Either way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, for both. Um, It'd just be an amendment to Exhibit C for both. Yeah. And we'd. Yeah. Both. Since we've already approved it once. Yeah. Okay. So can you? You guys good? You can write that up. Mm -hmm. and get that ready. We're good. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, number five, a uh, motion for preliminary adoption of the second reading of an ordinance vacating and selling a portion of alley right of way located north of Etna Street and east of South Plain Street. Mr. Tesla. No changes here. Again, the neighbor on the east side of the alley um, expressed interest in it. His owner at 2006 Etna. He owns all the lots adjacent to the alley on the east side. The owner to the west did not have any interest in the alley, um, would retain an easement over it as well. Sounds good. You want to waive that reading? I'm cool with it. Yes. Yeah, sure. Okay. Number six, motion for preliminary adoption of the second reading of an ordinance amending Chapter 126 taxi cabs and vehicles for hire of the Burlington, Iowa Code of Ordinances and deleting Chapter 127 vehicles for hire drivers in its entirety. Chief? Just a real quick update on that. I don't know if you have that in front of you, but if you look at page six of the new ordinance, the very last paragraph, and what it talks about is a central dispatch center. That that shouldn't that paragraph was meant to be deleted or struck. It shouldn't have been in there, and it's been struck now because they're not going to be required to have a dispatch service. Sure, remember that. Just wanted to make sure I pointed that out and that you knew about that. You guys have any other questions or? Yeah, uh, I asked last week um, for uh, companies like Uber and Lyft. Mm -hmm. Well, their vehicles have to be um, alike. Well, they have to look so they can. It can be a black vehicle and a white yep. vehicle and a red vehicle. Yeah, they just have to be identified as Uber. Correct. Are they going to be independent contractors or are they going to be part of the corporation? I don't know. You'd have to ask. I don't know. I'm assuming that they're independent contractors to Uber, I would assume. I don't. Okay. I doubt that they're employees of Uber. Well, part, part of the ordinance requires that the, that the corporation identify the officers and, and provide that information to your office, and that's... Um, I, I'm, I'm just I'm curious. Well, I think Uber is going to be re Uber the company is going to be required to do that with the state. I'm confident of that because I know they have to show proof of financial responsibility as well. And that's what that addresses is the actual company, not the drivers. Okay. They're independent contractors. I don't see how they could do it any other way. I just I'm. What's that? I just looked it up. What's that? That they are independent contractors. Okay. I just figured we have the information right here. Thanks, Tom. But it was interesting. I was approached probably four or five different times at Steamboat Days from <laughs> the younger generation going, where's your Uber at? Where I mean, it's coming. I mean, that's just oh, yeah. what it's all coming to. And I said, well, yeah, unfortunately, I don't, I, we don't have it yet. But. No, don't get me wrong. Two things. One, one is I, I don't have... Uh, a problem with app-based programs and, and getting rid of dispatchers sure. and that sort of stuff. And I, I, I've got a problem with 
millionaires telling us how yeah. we're going to run our, our yeah. local cab services. And, and um, the, 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 uh, if my employees were independent contractors, I would have some huge tax liabilities, and I don't. I'm not sure how this is going to work, mm. where they're where they're working at the direction of Uber, and they're working as a, through a dispatch. Even though it's an app-based application, they're going to be dispatched by by this uh, by this app. Yeah, they it's would not, be self-dispatched. I mean, as they look at the app, the way I understand it, and a, a fare pops up, they can click on if they want to take it or if they don't. They don't. They're not required in any way, shape, or form to take that fare. Mm -hmm. That's my understanding. Yes, that is right. correct. That's right. So they're not dispatched. I don't. I mean, that's, they're, that's so how the, I. So the app just comes up and says, "We've got this. We got this fare, and here's where it is. Do you want it? No, I don't. Okay. Do you want it? Mm. Yeah, they're not required to take that fare. So then the guys they can work whenever they want. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And whoever responds first gets it. It's not like two people can say yes and then it's like raced. <laughs> hmm. Amazing. I have a, just a just an antidote. There's a there's a company in town that uses contractors to install uh, um, cable for television. Okay. And uh, one of my employees gets a call and, and says, uh, "This says." Uh, the, the call come in, it was something like, um, we're outside your crib uh, uh, to install your your cable. And there were two gentlemen, they, uh, uh, the, my employee really didn't want to let him in, but he wanted to have cable. And it's also in installing the cable for, for, uh, computers and these guys were independent contractors they, they they worked at the direction of the or dispatched or got the orders from or whatever and it, from uh, from well it's from Mediacom so it was and um, I, I just wondered I, I, I'm what what kind of vetting process these they're they're going uh, going to use state. I mean if anybody can step up and say I want to be an, an uber driver and they can what I mean who, who are we going to have out there yeah the only the way I understand that that portion of it, the way I understand it to work is that's that's on uber and and is it these the exact same state law will require that they meet these standards so it'll be on Uber to make sure that their drivers meet these standards. And if they don't, the state will have the option to revocate their permit. Mm -hmm. And that'll be the same way for us, because we no longer are going, to rev or going to permit the drivers. We can't. We can't do that anymore. But what we can do is, is I have the right to inspect at any time that your drivers are within these qualifications or these guidelines. But they've shifted that liability from, well, at a local level, from the police department back to the cab services, saying, here's the qualifications, and you just need to make sure your employees meet these qualifications. Basically, it's you have to be 21 years or older, minimum three years driving experience, car insurance in your name, a social security number, and then you give them permission to do a background check, which checks for DUIs, accidents, reckless driving, criminal history, that kind of thing. That's what I did. So they checked my entire life. And yeah, and also the car has to be new. You have to own the car. Um, has to be four doors, at least. Yeah, insured and certain yeah. limits insured. Does that mean if you own, does that include lease? That I'm not quite sure about. It says use their own car, so I don't know if that means. Uh, probably lease is okay then. And I'm still trying to figure out the permitting process. Is it the, the cities that Uber has to permit through, or do they get one permit from the state to operate in the state? And I got about four calls into the DOT and six voicemails. And yeah, and that's where I'm at on that. I'll keep you posted on those return calls. Just because I want to know in my mind if 
their permitting process? Is one permit good for the state? And if it is, or do they actually have to be permitted for Burlington, Cedar Rapids? I, you know, I don't know. And I don't know if the state knows because I haven't got a call back yet. But we're going to find did you, out. Did these four or five young people that ask you about Uber, you tell them we didn't have that, but they could call Yellow Cab or yeah, Absolutely, ABC. I did. I said, we have two cab companies, A to Z and Yellow. That's exactly what I told them. Good job. And they, they needed a ride. I don't know who <laughs> they ended up with, but they needed a ride. And they were responsible enough to look for one, so it was impressive. That was impressive. Anyway. Thank you, Jim. Yep, thank you. All right. We're good? Good. Number seven, motion for preliminary adoption of the second reading of an ordinance amending section 170.50, Board of Adjustment of Chapter 170 Zoning Code <coughs> of the City of Burlington Municipal Code. Mr. Chisholm. No changes from the previous reading. This again is uh, adding to our zoning code to allow special, special exceptions through the Zoning Board of Adjustment uh, section of our zoning code uh, where they can grant uh, approval of certain exceptions to the code based on conditions of the property. You guys want to waive that one or? What, what is the zoning board? Have they had any say about this? Or? They, they've been very supportive of it. They've been very frustrated. I think the last couple of years that all they do is deny variances and approve special use permits for home occupations. They didn't feel they had much role to grant anything. Or, I sympathize. Yeah. <laughs> They've been there, done that. They've been there, done that. I'm okay with waving it. But. Oh, yeah, I am too. Good? Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. All right. All right, moving forward. Number eight, resolution approving the preliminary plat of Ingram subdivision. Mr. Teslin. We have the preliminary and final on the agenda here. Now, this is in the county two mile area just north of the city off Memorial Park Road. Um, they're looking to do a four lot subdivision. It's going through the county process as well, but they did not have any comments or issues with what they're looking to do. Um, based on the lot size, uh, ranging from about 1.3 acres to 2 acres, with two lots on Memorial Park uh, Drive and then a 30-foot access easement to the back two uh, lots. Um, there are no public utilities uh, installed with this, but based on the number of lots, it does have to go through our major subdivision, which uh, anything over three lots requires a preliminary plat and final plat. Um, they are asking to uh, waive uh, the city zoning code requirement that requires all lots to have frontage on a public street for lots two and four uh, by means of the utility easement um, that would serve as a private drive to those uh, lots uh, two and four along with the utility easement. Um, again, this has uh, been reviewed by the county. Uh, they do not uh, have any issues or questions on it, but trying to coordinate the process through the city at the same time. Okay. Council? You guys good? No. Yes. Mm -hmm. sure. No, yes. Yes. Yes, no. Inspector General, you're good? Okay. Number nine, resolution approving the final plat of Ingram subdivisions. Okay, on to the proposed consent agenda. A resolution approving purchase of a 2018 Elgin Pelican NP for Public Works Street and Sewer Division. Nicholas. In front of you is a capital improvement item that was uh, planned out last uh, during the budget season. Um, be purchased after July 1st, so it'll be fiscal year 18. Um, it is a little over budget or a little over what was the proposed budget was. Um, it was purchased through the uh, state of Minnesota purchasing uh, the state bid. So, any questions? Didn't we get something cheaper that, uh, that we had some other equipment that was a little bit cheaper and it was pretty much washed? And all um, we, we did get the uh, combination truck, which is a little bit cheaper. It's, that's sewer yes. money versus road use. but. This net cost is cheaper than what was budgeted too, isn't it? With the trade-in? With the trade-in? No, it's about 3,000 more. I thought the trade-in was... I oh, the I'm trade sorry. Was I 39,000. Right. How old is uh, how old is ours? I think it's an 09. Yeah. That's what it says here, 09. Yeah. So this is a brand new one? Correct. Do you have pictures? I don't. I'll just Google it, I guess. <laughs> I 
think I don't think it looks that much different than our our previous sweepers. I don't think they've changed too much. <laughs> it's a it's a mechanical sweeper instead of a vac sweeper, so it's got the brushes in front rather than. They've got um, regular sweepers at Dollar Store for like three ninety nine. If you really <laughs> wanted to save the taxpayers' money, I'm good. You guys? Yeah. For our usage. Pay for the Sweep America, guys. All right. We're good? Yep. Okay. Uh, next, we have a resolution establishing a no parking zone on the south side of the 1100 block of Arch Street in its entirety. Yep. So we had a request come in from a property owner off the 1100 block of uh, Arch Street. As you can see here, the resolution would create no parking on the south side of Arch Street. Um, Arch Street is a dead-end road that serves four properties. We sent out um, surveys uh, to the property owners. We received three back that were in favor. Uh, the fourth, I believe, is uh, not a very frequent user of the property. So uh, Public Works recommends approval based on uh, the width of the road and um, accessibility for snow removal and whatnot. Sounds good. Any questions for Nick? Thank you, Nick. Okay. Resolution approving renewal of a three year lease agreement with the operation of the Iowa store, located in the Port of Burlington. Welcome, Senator. Um, this is just a three year renewal from the previous three year renewal uh, with uh, the Iowa store and uh, Miss Bonnie Baldwin. Um, the only thing that changed from the previous agreement was the dates. Um, insurance and everything stay the same after mm -hmm. conversating with our attorney. So there's nothing okay. too new about this. Okay. <clears throat> Questions, counsel? Nope. nope. Good to go. All right. And the resolution approving a professional service agreement with HR Green for Mr. Fitting's wastewater treatment plant, or our wastewater treatment plant that Mr. Fitting takes such good care I think of it as mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> done a lot of work with HR Green for yeah. the years um, at the wastewater treatment plant. Um, that uh, work that we've done has kind of resulted in a familiarity between mm -hmm. us and them, our people, their people. Uh, they're very familiar with our wastewater treatment facility. Uh, there are times that uh, questions or issues have arisen that we've uh, felt uh, free to call them. Sometimes it's while a particular project scope is being um, gone through and we're working with them and we'll bring something that's really outside the scope and ask them about it and they typically have helped us out. There's also times when we don't have anything actively going on, but we touch base with each other and uh, we think of them when we have a, an issue that arises. Um, these are issues that typically are issues that would not be something that would be easily answered by our current, our, our existing engineering department. Um, and so again, we would uh, contact HR Green and Again, they've been very helpful through the years, but they suggested to us this uh, agreement <coughs> which would set up uh, a formal <coughs> understanding, a, a formal agreement where if we had an issue that arose, uh, it would give us a resource to go to and uh, provide a means for them to be um, compensated for any time that they might spend in researching an item and providing us answers to the questions that we raise. Uh, so we're asking, uh, we're seeking the approval of council to allow the uh, mayor to sign the agreement. Um, I assume the city clerk would assign a contract number to that agreement. It's for a one-year period, a uh, maximum of $10,000, meaning that uh, we could have a, a, a work done for us that might cost us seven hundred dollars and that would go against that ten thousand we would uh, process the invoice uh, assign it to that contract number and as time goes on uh, we could use uh, very little of that ten thousand dollars in the next fiscal year or we could end up using all of it um, 
but in order to exceed that dollar amount, we'd have to have the agreement amended before we could yeah. go beyond that. Okay. So that's reasonable. Good, I like it. So. Everybody satisfied? Yep. Thank you, Don. Hey, good Thank going. You. Hey, how's the water going? Downhill. <laughs> yeah, downhill. <laughs> we love this guy. I don't know why. I don't know. Why. You guys good? Yep. Sure. Okay. And we have some public hearings set for June, July 17th. Consideration of sale of property locally known as 718 Columbia Street, City of Burlington, Iowa, with conditions. Uh, anything you want to say on that, Mr. Tisdall? Just a uh, home uh, that we acquired uh, through the abandoned building program. It is in our local historic district on the corner of uh, 8th and Columbia. I uh, have had a couple interested in purchasing it to rehab. Sweet. Have they set an offer price or anything like that? Just the minimum amount at this time. It does have Five, yeah, quite a bit of uh, repair work on the inside. There's a lot of water damage and it is in not the mm -hmm. not very good condition. But it is in the historic. It is in the historic, which so <coughs> any exterior changes or updates would have to go through the HPC, but if they're just, they can do anything to the inside, but any exterior changes would have to get approval mm -hmm. through the HPC. Okay. Uh, B is consideration of an ordinance vacating and selling a portion of Oak Street right of way located east of Bluff Road, Burlington, Iowa. C is consideration of a permanent encroachment agreement with John and Doris Champagne for encroachment into city right of way adjacent to the property lo located at 1500 Madison Avenue, Burlington, Iowa. D is consideration of plans and specs for the 2017 Harrison Avenue storm sewer improvements. And E is consideration of the plans and specs for the 2017 <coughs> flow metering project. Right. <coughs> Discussion items. Okay. Uh, treasurer's report. <clears throat> um, in your packets, May's treasurer's report. Um, for the most part, everything's we're just going right along. We're going to be doing our big transfers, the second half transfers in June. So when I look over the balances, I don't see anything that's not that's that's outstanding, that's alarming, that we're not we don't already have planned for or as a, or as a timing issue. So I didn't know if you guys looked through and had any questions. Are we right? That we're going to be done with all these negative balances at the end of June. We'll still have <coughs> some. If you look at the capital projects sheet <coughs> some, some of those will be projects that are in process so they'll yeah. still be carrying a deficit. I don't mean that I, don't mean that. I mean the, uh, the ones in terms of the depth the long-term deficit accounts that yeah. go with finished projects uh, yeah golf we'll course have them all is gone. scheduled golf to be course is the last taken care of reflex those those, those are June transfers cool. that okay. we haven't made gone. yet so yeah and cool. if you look at our balance balance <coughs> right now we're at 43 million um, we did a, a refinancing on a debt issue for seven million or so. Yes. Um, seven that million. so we had that money borrowed in March and sitting there waiting for <coughs> to, pay, to pay off the old debt issue in June. Um, and then we borrowed ten million for capital projects uh, that were uh, just getting we're just getting started on. So we've got a lot of money sitting uh, for work to be done. But then in June, it kind of goes back to... A lot of it will go where, away in June. Yes, where, but, where we were at kind of before <coughs> because we make all our debt payments and yeah. all that Everybody stuff knows how that works. You know, <laughs> payday, you're rich, and then five minutes later, you're broke. We got to keep it for a little bit. <laughs> so. You guys have any questions? Thank you for your work. I really appreciate it. Thanks. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Annette. Number two, Central Avenue Bridge Retaining Wall Engineering Assessment. Mr. Matt. <coughs> I got a big piece of paper here. Mm -hmm. Couldn't fit it on. Oh, boy. Yes, sir. At least you know how to make the numbers bigger. Uh, yeah, otherwise it's been really small. I used to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, and that Nick doesn't shoot the witness. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Shameful. Um, should have so never said that. I was so embarrassed. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. Am I ready? <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, so we hired Stanley Consultant, who's also working on Mount Pleasant Street design to take a look at the Central Street Bridge. Um, as you know, we had kind of a pile of brick uh, on the Dress Rand site, kind of holding up what a wing <laughs> wall that was all bowed out. And there's been some issues over the past. We had them take an assessment on this. Um, what's in front of you is kind of a recommendation of some of the fixes, um, not just immediately, but over the long term. As you can see in the red, as it, it's, it indicates at the very bottom, things that should be done in uh, one to two years, two to five years, and then five to 10. Um, I wanted to cover this quick and then bump into, I have a PowerPoint presentation um, to kind of show you some of the things that they're talking about. But as you notice, the, the, the big thing that they highlight in the first couple of years is uh, a seal between the abutment and the bridge deck um, that is allowing water to go underneath the structure and cause some erosion to happen. Um, not only that, but then the freeze-thaw cycle uh, is the reason why those wing walls, which aren't structural to the bridge, um, cause a little woe in them. Um, but as you notice, $137,000 is recommended in one to two years in fixes um, for the bridge. I think that the abutment, the abutment pieces are probably the fairly easy ones to tackle. Um, about, you know, from anywhere from six to twelve thousand uh, dollars. The big one is on that is retaining wall G, which you'll be able to see when I get into my slideshow. So, unless there's any questions right on that, I'll jump into the slideshow to kind of show some images on what I'm talking about. No. It's gone. It switched here. Hmm? It switched here. Oh. Press the button, Nick. Is that how you do that? <laughs> it froze. It broke. <clears throat> Jim broke it. It is. Mm. Mr. Texas. First he shoots the witness, <laughs> now he broke this. <laughs> I don't this guy. It's like the last time I'll go to a demonstration. <laughs> That's a sign of a confident person. <laughs> when I was in that room where everyone else had gone through that thing, and, and then I did that, Walk I, away, I felt James. so small. I am small. <laughs> okay, here we go. So, um, as I was referring to earlier, retaining wall G um, is up on the northwest corner. So, uh, that is that retaining wall that you saw with the brick. It's got a fairly decent woe to it. Uh, but these images kind of tell you the story as to the reasons why the bridge has seen some, some need of repair. Uh, as you can see here, these are the, the bridge, and this is probably the better case, where you can actually see the bridge deck versus the abutment. Um, that seal there is pretty much gone and allowing water inside underneath between the abutment and the deck. And so what it does is it gets in behind there and it causes um, concrete to break. And so that's what you see here. And just as a, the, the, this crack here is on the wing wall and it's not a structural concern. There is no concerns with the bridge. What we are doing from this assessment and the recommended fixes are to preserve the life of the bridge. So I want to make that clear before Thanks. somebody sees that image and says, I shouldn't be going over that bridge. No, it's, it's, in, it's fine. It's, these things here are just things that will help preserve the life of it. So the retaining walls, they help keep in the sediment to um, keep the, the bridge in place. Um, so you can see here, there's water that gets in between the abutment and it flows down and causes erosion there. Um, and then you can see where it really happens, it has big problems is with the ice and it causes things to expand. Uh, this is, I don't know why they call it the Murray Turbo Tunnel, but um, there's some issues there. Uh, those are called out in the later years. Um, anyway, those are the pictures I had. I, I can maybe explain some of this more um, if there's mm -hmm. any questions on it, but 
for the most part, I, you'll, you'll see some of these items. Some of these items can be fixed probably in this current fiscal year. Well, 18, Will some 18 of them pretty. Um, I would say that we could do the abutment seals uh, this year. Um, the big, the retaining wall, uh, the $79,000, that would probably be a CIP item for next year. You're going to do all the abutments this year? Probably. Uh, I, I have a feeling that that's what we're going to be working on. So I, our staff might be able to do this. Um, I feel fairly confident in them Good. being able to replace it. Um, in, the, in the assessment, there's some design on how to go in there and cut down and replace the seal. So I think our staff could probably do it. If not, um, I would definitely see these things being done. So. So you're looking at a project in next year's CIP to hopefully Correct. do next spring, summer? Yes. I would, I would say that we would look at doing the retaining wall G next summer um, and then try okay. and strategically place the fixes of the other retaining walls um, in the later years. Is there a value to doing it all at once? There probably is some mobility cost from a contractor's perspective. You should take a look at that. I mean, the, the funding source that you'd be using probably is going to be out of road use tax, Correct. which sits with $1.9 in it right now. And we will use a portion of it, but we've got a balance in there that we can look at. So okay. keep it in mind. Yep. So <laughs> these are just things that will help you know, preserve the life of it yet again. So You're supposed to be doing this, Nick. That's why we hired you. Anything else? No. Good. Thank you, my friend. Uh, next, number three, update on codes for care facilities. This is kind of an update. Uh, I guess on care facilities, family homes. Uh, staff has been looking into these codes, uh, into codes recently uh, regarding residential care facilities. Uh, these homes have become more frequent in the past uh, couple years with changes in state law. Uh, regarding uh, mental health care and family homes um, and changes in those. So they're not something that we've had much issue with in the past or we're fully aware of previously. Uh, but based on the growing number of these homes, and we've had a couple recent fires on uh, mm -hmm. North 7th and Lui or North 9th and Louisa Street, kind of brought it to our attention a little more uh, yeah. so as well. Uh, we've been looking at our codes to further determine if these homes are properly following the currently adopted codes uh, or if we need to make some corrections in how we're enforcing our codes. Um, so a couple uh, different codes these uh, fall under. Uh, one is the zoning code. Under the state code, uh, chapter four and four, that regulates zoning, uh, we cannot uh, require any additional permits for family homes that are registered with the state under uh, chapter 135C. Uh, so if they're registered with the state, they're allowed to go in any residential zoning district uh, provided they are registered with the state. If they're not registered with the state, under our current zoning code, it requires a special use permit for transitional or assisted living facilities that these family homes would fall under that goes to the zoning board uh, for uh, consideration of approval, uh, provided they're in, they're in R1, 2, or 3 zones. Uh, the second component is the building code uh, that's adopted by the city. Uh, it's the international code adopted by the state as well. Uh, that classifies care facilities within a dwelling as an R3 occupancy. Uh, that's an occupancy standard, it's not zoning, uh, which kind of gets a little confusing. But um, basically for R3 uh, care facilities, this up on the overhead here. Stephanie, if you want to switch over to this. Uh, it's listed in uh, this memo as well, but makes it uh, pretty clear what a care facility within a dwelling which is has five or fewer persons receiving care that are within a single family dwelling are permitted to comply with the international residential code provided an automatic sprinkler system is installed in accordance with uh, 903.3.13 of the international residential code. So uh, essentially these care facilities that are in a dwelling uh, that have <coughs> five or fewer individuals do require a, a sprinkler system. Um, we did reach out to some other communities uh, put it out on the mailing list of the international building officials in Iowa and received back uh, uh, quite a few comments. Um, Council Bluffs, Ankeny, Iowa City, Sergeant Bluff, Mount Pleasant, Sioux City, Urbandale, Muscatine. So big and small communities and they all concurred uh, the, their interpretation of the state code and uh, what was described how we, uh, these are care facilities and homes that they do require uh, sprinklers. Um, and also uh, did uh, get comment from uh, one of the building officials in Ankeny that had some 
discussion with the state that they would require sprinklers as well if they're licensed with the state. So um, this is kind of a, just an update to council. It is something that we haven't dealt with as much in the past, but uh, do have quite a few in Burlington, seem to be a growing number more as well. I would imagine. Um, but based on our examination of our codes, contact with other communities and looking at the state codes, um, they would be required to have a sprinkler system, get a special use permit if they're not registered with the state. And these aren't new codes for Burlington. This is just enforcing our codes that we have on the book, but uh, becoming more aware at a staff level what those codes were. Um, so our uh, goal going forward would be to uh, notify the properties that we're aware of, some of the companies. There's a range of different companies that operate these care facilities in the community. Um, request that they, if they're not registered with the state or licensed with the state, that they apply for a special use permit within 90 days. And then uh, within upon approval of the special use permit that they would be required to install the sprinkler system within one year of approval of that. So, um, Again, just an update to council uh, kind of on what our review and contact with other communities are. Uh, it isn't an easy issue, I'm sure, for some people. There have been a lot of changes in the state laws and how mental health and uh, family homes are regulated. and. Uh, it's something that's just become more prevalent and we've become aware of and want to make sure we're Amen. making home safe and uh, enforcing our codes appropriately. So. Amen. I know the Inspector General doesn't have any problems with that one. one. One item that did come up, I guess, as well is, I think there's an article in the newspaper a while ago, but there's a home in Washington, Iowa, where an individual is killed in one of these facilities, yes. and that sparked a lot of kind of re-examination of codes as well. So yeah. we want to make sure we're making a safe community from a code standpoint. This, but this will put some, you have some agencies that already have these facilities mm -hmm. up without sprinklers, so making this kind of a change is, there will be some hard, it does lead to some changes for them too, mm -hmm. some increased cost to try to do business so, the way they are. But again, as your department has taken a look at this, and really I, I kind of pushed a little bit too, just to, the concerns with, from a safety perspective, are we making sure that we're we're doing things appropriately? Um, it seems like this is what we should be doing. Yeah. I agree. You guys good? Yes. Yeah, I think it's, I agree it's the right thing to do, but I, I would strongly encourage you to get a hold of these companies right away and let them know what we're finding and, I mean, Op Optima and, um, uh, other companies like them and because this is this could be huge expenses for them and they're mm -hmm. I know some of them are struggling right now if uh, one of the companies has cut the salaries of the employees because of the operating costs that they're experiencing and the, and the payback that they're getting from yeah, the different yeah. government agencies is just not theirs so. Uh, the more more notice they have, the better their chances of finding the mm -hmm. funding to get this done, or working with the property owners to to renting from. We good. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Eric. Yeah. Number four: treating dust from gravel surfaces as a nuisance. Mr. Tesla. Actually, I don't know if this staff has as good of a way of framing this as this came as a request from a, well, through the council for, from a citizen on a specific property, but it relates, you start trying to figure out how you deal with a given specific incidence and you have to figure out how does this fit within an overall context of a community. Um, and I think that, Tim, you had brought this up and I think the last email that you sent out had a, a good summary if you wanted to kind of present that and what you're looking at and the concerns that were raised. Well, the, the, uh, the, the citizen was looking for answers and, uh, and the, dust was, the dust was the last answer that he was looking for, how to, how to handle it, but he, he was uh, trying to find out whether it was classified as a nuisance and in our code it's not classified as it's not identified as a nuisance. It very well could be a nuisance, but it's not identified as a nuisance. The, uh, and uh, um, 
I'm forgetting what exactly I had in the last email because I had there were so many of them. But um, what, one of the uh, uh, do you want to do you want to you got it yeah. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to read it to you because it, um, and we can go from there. Uh, please do not think that I'm proposing that we start issuing nuisance citations for dust or that I support silt coating all graveled surfaces. I simply want to have a discussion on the issue. I want to show the citizen I am being responsive to his questions. If we decide we uh, can do nothing, then, then we need to say so instead of beating around the bush. If you go to the beginning of this email exchange, you'll see that I have not indicated that I thought that dust, dust should be treated as a nuisance, that we should silt coat all the alleys. I have suggested that, uh, and I do support that if, um, uh, let's see, I do support that, or I do support that. Uh, I did ask uh, if it was considered nu nuisance, and I just asked the question that was being asked to me, and I did not have uh, an answer to. I did state that we could do, that we could be helpful with the neighbors, neighborhood wished to take, care, take the problem on themselves, and we can consider providing engineering services and planning that would coincide with other work the city was having done. Uh, that has been done successfully in the past. This is not an option that I can call Mr. Albright and, and tell him that it is not. <clears throat> and my concern was that Mr. Albright has been contacting the city since Bruce Schlegel was city manager. And he's never been given a direct answer or a, uh, as to whether anything can be done, and he's never been giving an answer to what can be done if anything can be done. And that's what I was searching out for him, is can anything be done? Well, at, at, with the discussions or the emails that I've had back and forth with the city manager there, and, and Charlie Nichols and, and Eric, there, there's nothing in the code to provide for this. So now it becomes a, a, a political uh, thing uh, for the council to address. My perspective on it is, I, I don't think we have the money that we can silk coat all of the alleys and all the gravel surfaces in town. And I don't know that we can uh, uh, cite someone for a nuisance when we're not willing to take care of that <coughs> same dust issue ourselves. So how do we, how do we better serve the, customer, the citizen that's having the issue? <coughs> And again, I go back to if the citizen wants, if the citizens in a particular neighborhood wants to take on the issue, that the very least that we can do is provide engineering services and planning so that when we do have dust control services, services going on in the area, or we do have silt coat going on in the area, that we can uh, work with the contractor to get that particular area taken care of at the same time. Am I making sense? Yes. Jim, what do you think of this? Um, so th in the given situation, that, that, that's a private alley. It's not city alley anymore. It's, we, I guess we sold that back in 1969 or something like that. vacated in 69. We're still looking to see if it's actually been sold or if it's still owned by the city. It, okay. it has been vacated, so it's not a public alley, but, but finding the records on whether it was It sold. was actually transferred yeah. over or not. Um, if, from a private perspective, you have to treat it as, as a nuisance, could they, could we, if they wanted to wor work with us to, to tag off of a project, um, on a private situation that gets a little bit iffy to try to, to tag off, although they're certainly welcome to work with a contractor that we have to <coughs> do something. Um, public alleys, uh, the concern that I would have if you, I, I think it makes sense for us if we have a group of property owners that want to have their alley paved and tag off of one of our projects to, to let them do that. And, that. and we've done that on some, we have a process that I haven't been involved with, but has been in place if you wanted, for places that want to widen their roads, if they're willing to pick up the tab, we've allowed that to happen in the past. We, yeah, we've, we've, allowed, we've allowed that and then also We've had uh, people that want, or neighborhoods that want to upgrade their streets from silk coat to, to hard surface concrete or asphalt. But going through that, you have to have everyone involved in the process. Right. So that, 
that certainly can be done, but if you have an alley with eight, eight properties off of it, eight property owners, you're gonna have eight folks who have to come together or be willing to do the assessment off of it for those yeah. who aren't willing to participate. Yeah. And we've done that. We've yeah. done those too. So. Yeah, and those, those, are, those are all fine options to do. It's just that's kind of the mechanism that you'd have to go through to, to do it. And, and to, to tag off of that, your point is what you made was that actually the note I wrote to myself, if we declare dust as a nuisance, then every one of our graveled alleys becomes a nuisance. And, mm -hmm. and yeah. for instance, in my alley, you have the eight property owners, but half of them never use the alley because there's no reason for them to be in the alley. So why would they be willing to pay to seal code an alley when they never use it? You know, so there's the issue, an issue so that the, I see, the, for instance. The issue on the gravel alley is not the smoothness, but the dust that's right, the created. Dust. I understand that, that, that would affect yeah. everybody. So. Right. so are you willing to pay for a little yeah. dust control? Right. Which, but it would be up to a neighbor. It would be up to a neighborhood to to agree. I mean, to somebody have to sell it. In yeah. other words, yeah. So I, I don't see that we have a from a staff, place to do anything. From a staff perspective, with the with the specific issue that came up, <clears throat> we we didn't have a recommendation to. I mean, the the options that we could see were included some wholesale. Uh, to, to treat a given scenario, you're, you're asking us to do it to everywhere. Yeah. And right. that becomes uh, as a level of cost that we can't afford. In fact, even from the idea of dust control, we don't, we have some, some gravel roads on the edge of town that we do dust control, but we don't really have any projects where we do it on in town. I can give you kind of an idea on cost. We actually piggyback off the county. Um, they're the ones that handle the contract with the dust control. Um, to give you an understanding of what that means for an alleyway, um, I had Chris work up the figures on kind of just an average alleyway on, um, you know, they run 12 foot wide where most of our alleys were anywhere from, you know, 12, 18 foot wide, um, about $300 per alley. Um, I also figured it up in a different way per linear foot. It's about 63 cents. Um, we have 167 lane miles of roads in town. If you would use a third of that number and say we have that much in alleyways, that becomes 55 miles worth of alleyways. That potentially becomes an option for dust control. And then you're in the, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to do dust control or that liability to do that. Um, and how many times is a year? Usually, typically, they do it twice a year. They do it earlier um, after, after the kind of the rain subside in May, um, and then they do it later in August. It's not something that we recommend doing just from the perspective of, is there a benefit to it? Yes, there is. But trying to weigh out where's the benefit of this versus other uh, costs that we have, uh, other projects that we're not getting to, <coughs> where's the relative value? And it, unfortunately, we can't make all of the, make every project work. But again, I'm not interested in spending taxpayers' dollars from all over the community, but if a neighbor Hood wants to have that done, we can arrange that for them. No, if it's done at the same time that all the rest of them are done, can we work with the county to get that? Since the contract's with the county, I would say that we. I think that they would have to try to, if when when we know the what who the contractor is, they could see if they could piggyback off while they're in town and do it. Yeah. I don't know whether we want to get into doing a bid spec off that, of alleys. That becomes pretty tedious work to try and get in there to, you, there's a lot of mobility costs in there that aren't seen either from moving from one site to another um, with some of the. And there's also a big difference for a contractor doing out or doing the gravel roads uh, versus coming into the community and having to do alleys. Correct. I, I don't know how many, you may have some contractors who are very willing to do it. And you, others who wouldn't have an interest in being involved in that. Um, from the perspective of the time involved to do individual alleys for, for our staff to help with that, um, you, you can look at the projects we have on board right now. Agency Street East, we are, did we do the contract with PNK last yeah, meeting? Yeah, it's approved. Um, we would prefer to do that in-house. We don't have the time to get to it. Um, 
our staff has is talking with Ryan when he was down doing the, the, the shooting the heights, shooting the the heights on Jefferson Street. Oh yeah. Um, he has eight projects that he's got sitting waiting to try to finish off that are all just sort of sitting there and he's trying to get at least one of them off of the book so he can get to the others. Um, we're not getting to what we need to get done. So technically, can we have our staff do it? Yeah, but then we're pushing off other work that we're going to have to have contracted out to an, an outside engineering firm. So that's, that's a priority that we're not willing to make. If you want as a council to make that, we can change yeah. that. But from our perspective, that's not where we want to I would to feel be. like something would have to give, though. No, don't, don't do it. Don't go. I, I, I wouldn't use engineering staff, in all honesty. I probably would use Chris. Um, mm. because he handles this contract anyway rather than get into engineering. That being said, to do one alleyway, you maybe have 20 property owners on that alleyway. I mean, if one comes in and wants to do it behind their alleyway, now you, you start the conversation with all 20 uh, property owners adjacent to that alley. You know, is there a, a petition process that would have to be started by at least a certain number of the people <coughs> in that alley to even to get that process going? I would think we would want to set that up at the very beginning rather than that's what that's why it was done in the past 80 percent of the neighborhood signing petition say they that they wanted it then we proceeded with it and i would say that dust control would probably not be done through a special assessment it would have to be an upfront cost yeah, yeah. it'd be billed out yeah. to them i, I yeah, know that the it, county bills out through for their dust control so if a property owner in the county wants it done the property owner pays for it and it pays it goes on their taxes i guess i guess we probably could do that but and even as you get into that, the property owner in question here in the alley that he's talking about aren't, he doesn't live on that alley. And so now you're talking about trying to get cooperation from other property owners that aren't. I mean, if, are there's, also if there's an option out there that he can advise them about, then he's got some place to start talking. If he gets, if he goes nowhere with it, he goes nowhere with it. Mm -hmm. I'm just looking for options. If there is, yeah. if there is no options in the, in and I just don't, don't want to get too much in the weeds with it. Uh, I just don't think it's probably the best use of my staff's time. Uh, I think there's other things that needs to be done, uh, unless that direction is given to otherwise. Well, it's not. It, it's not limited to dust control. I was also talking about seal coating and or any other any other option. I mean, no. uh, I do have a concern with 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 seal coating and or paving alleys. We have a hard enough time in this town keeping our roads open. And yes, that road will probably, the alleyway doesn't have as much traffic load, but in 15, 20 years, now that alley is now a burden on the city to fix. It's a lot easier to maintain a gravel alleyway than it is <clears throat> a concrete alley or even a seal coat alley. And I think if the special assessment's done on the front end from the property owners, that it is ours to take care of after that. And I think it just becomes more more burden for the right, city. We've, we've not taken that approach in the past, and it's and and I've got a concrete alley behind my house, and and it's not been it's been it was put in when the when the development was done. So, uh, and it's still the city's the city's attitude has been on it that those are private drives, and uh, even though they're city right of ways and they're alleyways, and but they're uh, private drives, so the neighborhoods have to take care of them. I mean. They don't come out and uh, patch the alleys. We we patch it ourselves, and, um, and I, I know a lot of alleys are like that. I, I I don't think any of those that we've done in the past, and we've done at least three um, that we upgraded from from uh, gravel to concrete. That we've that cities taken ownership of that. Do we maintain the snow and stuff on it? No. I, no, I, I guess the I don't alleys. Know what and I guess what you're talking, and then you have other alleys like ours that is a concrete one that has uh, the heaves and no one's doing anything to maintain it. And you hit that, but that is our responsibility, and yet we don't do anything. When with you it. look at our downtown alleys, the spots where yeah. we're able to do it is where it is still. The, and what Nick is, I guess, getting at is, and a gravel alley is can a, a, a smoother surface, even though you get potholes and then you have to go in and take care of them, you can keep a long-term smoother surface easier at a cheaper price. A lot with cheaper price. With it that way than with an alley such as ours. And I mean, you have people who are taking care of yours. We don't have anyone who's doing it with ours, but. 
I mean, that's going to be different all over town. Every neighborhood is going to be different. But, okay. But I, it's still a question, how does the council want to proceed? Is it something that is no. an issue for one person, or is it an issue for all of you? Or No, it's not for me. It's not for me. No. And that being said, I, the speed limit in alleyways is 10 miles an hour. I don't know how much dust you can generate in alleys going 10 miles an hour, but Quite a bit. that, that is from, the speed limit. I can tell you from personal experience. <coughs> Quite, the only other thing I'd have to say about that alley, it's... Uh, being used by a business on a much greater basis than what most, most of the are. streets are being used in that uh, neighborhood and we don't re we're not requiring anything more than them maintaining gravel there there is concrete parking for those that are using the gravel and part of it uh, uh, much of that alley fronts on on uh, uh, residential properties but the majority of it is held by uh, by Hope Haven, and um, and there's the traffic is probably heavier on that alley than on any other street in that, uh, short of Lenox, um, than any other street in that entire neighborhood. Um, that being said, that's all I got to say about it. Okay. <clears throat> I'll Thanks. let Bill Albright know that the council and staff's not interested in taking care of his issue. Right. At least he's got an answer now after 10 years. Yes. Anybody okay. got any problems with appointments? No. Nope. All right. We're going to close out. Mr. Tisland? I did get a request for a subordination agreement. We did one before for one of our uh, owner occupied loan programs or refinancing. Uh, if they get the information, I'd like to put that on the agenda just so that they can refinance their, their mortgage uh, when they had some home improvements done. Um, but waiting for, we did one about two months ago for someone as well. I remember that. Yeah. That's all you got? Yep. Okay, sounds good. Antoinette? Nothing. Nothing. Wow, I'm surprised. Wow. I know, right? I'm disappointed. Mr. Scott? No, wait, I do. <laughs> I knew you wouldn't let me down. Come on. So, the film festival. <laughs> Right? That was pretty awesome. Not a, not a lot of people go, though. I kept getting asked if I was a filmmaker. And I'm, no, I you just like, like to watch you, movies. You look like you could be one of those ilk. Yes, yeah, so I think <laughs> I think more people need to know about it. They gotta come out and see it. It's a fun time. If anybody watches movies, like, does anybody here not watch movies? Not very I don't. Not Never. Very, well, no, Never, I used ever. to. I just haven't watched a movie in a long okay, time. Okay, then you're excused. <laughs> not very Everyone nice. else is not excused. Shame, <laughs> shame. You were there. I was no. there. I, didn't, I was there for three days. I was there, sa <laughs> I was there Saturday night. What's, what's the average length of each film? It goes from minutes? two minutes to, I think the longest one was 25, 30 minutes. Hmm. I thought they were 40 minute films. Nope. And it's a wide variety, comedy, say, foreign, and drama. And some, 100 and some films. Well, you were there all three days? Mm -hmm. You're special. Thanks. That's it. Okay. Tim Scott. My daughter, my oldest daughter, the jock, ran 27 miles today. and huh. It's her first, first leg of her 180-mile trip. She, uh, she started at 6.30 this morning, got done at 2 o'clock this afternoon. She was disappointed she couldn't get it to 30 miles. She wanted to do 30 miles her first day, but she said her feet just wouldn't let her go. Her heart was there, but her feet wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. She's doing this over a week? Over, yeah, this week. Wow. So between the two of you, you can say you averaged 13 and a half miles today? <laughs> no, she done 26 <laughs> miles today. <laughs> I he done trying five. trying to give me an opening there. Wait a minute, let me see. Yeah. <laughs> I done 7.24. Yeah. Okay. Good going. I want to uh, thank the group that came down to City Hall. We did a, we had another tour down here of uh, uh, some future uh, leaders of uh, of our community, and I just want to thank uh, Jim. Every time I every time I do a tour, I try not to harass too many people, but I always go to the city manager's office and uh, torture him for a while. So I do want to thank him for being a good sport and always uh, when I bring in the groups that you're uh, I could count on you. So. Uh, thanks for that. Some guy said the city manager was cool. Tell him I said that. So 
Uh, I'm praying for that guy. He's really got, He's problems. got some problems. So, yep. Mayor Pro Tip. No thanks. No thanks. City Manager. Uh, anyone willing to switch radio first to second week? Where? Okay. Next week. Next week? Let me look. Wednesday. It's our family vacation next week. It's July 5th. Yeah, you'll be able to see. Bob? Yes. You're good? Yep. We've got the bishop. Sure. Okay. What time again? Nine. 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 It's nine. Nick Mack. Next Wednesday. July 5th. Yeah. July 5th. He's here now. Um, you will start to see uh, flood wall operations, uh, the, build, the, the building oh, cool. of it. Start this week. Uh, some security Steve fencing will go school. up, yes. and then the uh, the trailers that they have uh, will be going into the south parking lot. Um, uh, so there will be some signs going up for vacating of parking. Um, the two easternmost or the easternmost lane on the between the auditorium and port will be asked to vacate, and I'm not sure the amount in the south parking lot, but there will be signage going up this week. So I expect to see that. All okay. right. And then demolition will start, and then. It'll be, be in operation, so keep that river down low. They don't have a requirement of how high the river has to be in order to work, or do they? Um, for some of the demolition work, they don't. Um, I think they do when they start dropping H-piles in. If it hits 15 foot, they, uh, they stop. Right. So there's some stuff that will, there's some operations that will require less than around less than 10 foot so i know that we're headed there. i haven't i haven't had that since i've been here so we're headed there we're hopefully headed we there. we don't have any more of that high river stuff so okay just heads up that's going on you know i do the switch i i'm not even in town on the 12th so <laughs> if you want to do your regular week you can i'll have someone else come in on, on the fifth if you want to stay on this uh, this next week, that's fine too. But I'll have to have the staff do the other one. It's up to Just stay where you're at. Okay. okay. So stay where we're stay with the word they're trying to get out and do it. Let's do it. Wait, wait, wait a minute. So, wait, wait, so let let stay where we're at. Where? Who's stay on the fifth? Stay on the fifth. Stay on the fifth. Stay on the fifth. Oh, okay. Yeah, you said it. Yeah. I'll be on the fifth. If anyone's interested in doing the league's annual conference, it is in Davenport this year, September 27th to 29th. I think you already have a postcard on this. Yep, but it. if you're going to get registered, we need to get you registered. The sooner we do, the easier it is to get rooms for you. They, they hold, have a block uh, that they set aside, and it's on a first come, first serve, and people right. end up holding them. And All right. Where is it at? Davenport. Davenport. Oh. I'm good. <laughs> okay. I can't believe you just said um, that. We're still here. Typewriter, typewriter shop. The yeah. that building has gotten to where the roof was done over the last couple of weeks. Uh, they had to do an awful lot of uh, repairs to the trusses underneath it, uh, more than what they had anticipated mm -hmm. on the front side. Um, but they, we did the walkthrough last week. Is that true, Eric? Yes. Yeah. Yep. And it, it passed inspection, uh, which means that that will be uh, one of the things that we did. We set aside $25,000 that they had to put up um, until they got the roof done. Now that it's certified, we'll be processing a check to reimburse them that $25,000 that they put on hold. That'll, I think, be in this next claims list, if not <coughs> I'm just not sure if you're on that. So you'll, you'll end up seeing that. Do you know um, what they're planning to do with that building? That building, they, they are getting it listed through Terrace Realty. Mm -hmm. um, I think in the 210, 220, yeah. 220,000 range, something like that. What? I think 219. 219. <laughs> um, you were close. That's close. So it's, it has <laughs> gone on the market. Uh, they still do have some, like they're going to be doing a, an organized clean out of the second and third floors, I think uh, July. Eighth yep. that Saturday morning, um, to get it to where it looks a little bit better. I know they've had people who've already gone through the facility, and they they have had some interest. Um, I don't know where where that will get sold or what price, but uh, that is the price point where they can be in a point where they're made whole in terms of the money that they had invested in it, <coughs> given that they had quite a bit of grant funding to help along the, yeah. the way. Uh, so that. That looks to be, we'll see how that all
proceeds, but they're in a position that they wanted to be in, a, in at least to be in a point where they can say that they have a, a good op potential to get it marketed at a price that, that keeps them whole. Where is the Tama building that they keep working at? It's uh, over there. <laughs> Well, That's the only the money you'll have all year. That's it. It's <laughs> a whole bag of tricks right there. October. I, yeah. What are they getting? They Mid to on, late October. Close to the end, or? No. They have. They've moved. Mid to the, late October. They have moved the date several times. I don't know whether the, they'll be able to hit that mid to late October or not. Um, Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Annie has a little bit of vested interest in this whole process, so she's kept up on it. Which is why I keep asking about all these other properties. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I want my I own place. <laughs> no, it, but it is proceeding, and they have done some neat things in that facility. I don't know if you've been yeah. involved in any of the tours, but yeah. it's they're doing some neat work in there. Yeah. Any issues with the typewriter building? It's all Steve Freevert's fault. <laughs> don't tell him, anybody. <laughs> okay. That was all I had. Before this gets out of control. Are we good? Yes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I got a feeling that lady in the back's going to tell on me. Oh, yeah. <laughs>